the college football show on the Coach T podcast presented by Turner Sports Training, TST. Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Hey. You know what time it is? Yeah. You know what time it is? You are watching a master at work. <laughs> Some people are probably like, what time is it? You know what time it is. Showtime. All right, we are back again on the Coach T College Football Show with my boy Mook. Mook, for the people out there, how are you doing? I'm doing awesome, man. I'm doing really well. It's getting to be uh, fall football weather out there. Yes. No more, yes. No more hot games. Uh, there's yes. a little bit of extra pep in everyone's step, and, and it's, it's football season, man. It's rolling. Yes, it is rolling, and uh, let's get going. All right, our first segment is the best of, and we'll do it for week three. Fans, we have done this every week. I had a couple of people tweet at me. They really like this segment. It's really a recap of the of the previous week. So let's recap week three with our best of segment. Special shout out here to Marco Trevinovic and the Proof Bar and Eatery in Griffith, Indiana. Great place if you're ever visiting the region. Go check that out. I'll begin here with my best play that I saw for week three. I had a, had, a, had a couple options here. The number one play I saw for week three was uh, Louisville's linebacker Jalen Alderman, his game-winning pick six for Louisville to beat UCF. I, I don't think I've ever seen a walk-off pick six in college football. That may have been my first, and I've seen a lot of college football. That was a wonderful play. That place was rocking when that happened, and that game was in Louisville, so it was just like the screen was shaking when I saw it. And that was, I think, a, a Friday night game. So I actually saw the highlight late after that, after our Friday game where we beat Lowell High School. Also, I, I really love the, and this is for you, I really love the one-handed interception uh, by Oklahoma's cornerback DJ Graham against Nebraska. That was amazing. Guy goes up and he does like the Matrix, like twists and turns and his body is like, perp- you know, like horizontal, I guess. Uh, yeah. You know, with the ground, he throws up his one hand and just picks it off. It was almost like the OBJ catch just on defense. It was crazy. It, it was amazing. It was amazing. Funniest thing is Lincoln Riley almost challenged it. <laughs> Cause yeah, he I heard him say something position. about that. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, he was going to take away the greatest Don't play you do that. that ever made. Don't you and do for, that, Lincoln Riley. Don't you do that. For some um, field and, position. <laughs> just for a field position. That, that's a head coach for you. Oh, yeah. And, and then my other top play that I had, and hopefully I'm not stealing these from you because, you know, I got three well, of so them. Well, so far you're two for two. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hopefully I'm three for three with this one. Yeah. Uh, Fresno State's quarterback, Jake Hayner, oh. his last second touchdown pass to Jalen Cropper uh, <clears throat> to stun then number 13 UCLA, our UCLA Bruins. I think it was 15 seconds left. Uh, Hayner throws. They go like crossing verticals and he fires it in to the, to the right uh, pylon. Receiver catches it, and lo and behold, another Pac-12 team goes down. So what was the best play you saw? Okay, so you covered the first two that I I actually wrote down three myself, and and now that you said that one, I'm like, well, how did I forget that one? But um, I actually I had you know the Alderman pick six, 67 yards off of a batted ball. But here here's the here's the other part of that is <clears throat> I thought the irony of how a batted ball won a game for one defense, and then a batted ball on the last play, won a game for an offense. And and that's where I went with uh, SMU over Louisiana Tech with uh, Tanner Mordecai on a last second. Uh, Hail Mary, a batted ball into the end zone, and uh, Reggie Roberson comes down with it. And uh, it's a walk-off for the, for the Mustangs winning that one. So, it, 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 you know, the ball bounces one way for the defense, and they return it back for a touchdown. The other one, it's a, it's a Hail Mary bounces – in the offensive hands, so yeah, that's the one I went with. Uh, it was it was pretty amazing in and of itself. But uh, yeah, that interception, you know, obviously a Nebraska fan, but that was sick. I yeah. mean, like yeah. I probably watched it thirty times. Yeah. I just kept scanning it back. I was like, wow, man. I, so, I didn't th- I didn't think a human could twist that way. That I didn't awesome. even think <laughs> I didn't think that was possible. Um, yeah. So. The, the, the best game that I saw for week three, and I got a few of these, um, the Fresno State upset win. We talked about that. That game ended 40-37. to 37. Um, Wonderful game there. Penn State's whiteout. 
like 110,000 fans. I'm going to hit on that a little bit later, but that was a wonderful game. I think that was probably the best game I've, I've, I've seen Sean Clifford play, quarterback for Penn State. Yeah. But I'm 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 going to go in the woods a little bit on this one. East Carolina's 17 point comeback win over Marshall. Listen, fans out there, they scored 21 unanswered all in the fourth quarter to beat Marshall. That was one of the games where, you know, I'm thinking, oh, this is a Marshall blowout. I, you know, I don't have to pay attention anymore. And then I look up, you know, but East Carolina is creeping more and more closer to, and again, 21 unanswered points in the fourth quarter. Wonderful game. I don't know how they do it, but but they do it. Just one of those crazy college football matchups. So that's probably my game of the week. East Carolina 17-point comeback win over Marshall. Wow. Yeah, I, I – I remember back in the, you know, gosh, a long time ago now, but I remember a uh, wild one with uh, East Carolina and, and Marshall before where, where they're helping Byron Leftwich down yes. the field, you know, <laughs> yes. carrying him down. With the twisted team. ankle. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they they went in like something like, you know, 63 to 58 or something ridiculous. But yeah, I, I, that's, I always think of that game when I, when, with that matchup. But um, I actually went game of the week with uh the nebraska oklahoma game um for a couple reasons defensive battle um, I know yeah you like. it was I, I think that it it um just the the history of that rivalry and and um the, i tell you you know being a nebraska fan they they tried several ways to get themselves blown out but <laughs> but they but they didn't <laughs> you know they, they they hung in there and you know adrian martinez he outplayed spencer rattler in the football game and uh and the the uh, Nebraska Cornhuskers they look Big Ten strong in that game, and that's not something I've always seen with them. I think that Oklahoma's got some things they need to 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 iron out. But you know uh, what can you say? You, you're the number three team in the nation, and and a team uh, trying to upset them with with the football uh, and a chance to chance to score. You know, to uh, to tie it, or you know, it didn't work out well for them that last possession, but they did have the opportunity to do it. So that's the one I went with. Um, you know, obviously because I am a Nebraska fan, but I think feeling good they play about tough. that match. They, play they tough. did. They played tough. Did. Uh, they still got to get uh, the special teams left. Left them nine yeah, points. The field, short. Yeah, they will. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it's just that's a mess, I, and I don't know what college kickers, is. man. The most unreliable people you can find, college kickers. Connor Culp was the, is the only Nebraska All Big Ten player. Uh, he was the Big oh, Ten shoot. Keeper of the Year last year, <laughs> you know, and he had missed five of his last six, and he's like missed you know like seven out of eight this year, plus two extra points. So, yeah, it's Jeez. a mess. <laughs> it's a mess, man. When it rains, it pours. The best coaching that I saw of Week Three was USC's interim head coach Dante Williams. It was the best coaching that I saw of week three, simply because you can't ask for a tougher position to be in as an interim head coach at a place like USC. Everyone already has you slotted to not have that job and, you know, put in Urban Meyer or put in Eric Bieniemy or put in, you know, name that other big time head coach. But you're able to come back from 14-0 down in Palouse, Washington, which... Again, anyone knows that place. It is very hard to play there. The fans are crazy, and it's just a weird place to play. They come back 14-0, score 45 unanswered points. So I want to I want to give it up. My best coaching in week three, USC interim head coach. Hopefully, I don't have to call him interim head coach. You never know. USC's coach, Dante Williams. Yeah, that's a great pick. Eh? That is a very tough spot, and but to come back at that victory, I mean, you know, you got to hats off to him on that. Yeah, honestly, I, I, you know, part of me wanted to go with Dan Mullen just for the, um, just for the way he got those Gators going, especially in that second half. Alabama, they had a shot. Win. They had a great you know, shot to win it. They, they did. They, they really did. Um, I, I am going to go with uh, Cam DeBoer of uh, Fresno State. Oh, though. there we go. There we go. Uh, when you, when you take out, you know, uh, you know the. Uh, Chip Kelly and and the uh, and our Bruins, you know, you, you got to get some uh, you got to get some uh, hats off. Um, and you know, there's a lot of people that, that kind of feel like Fresno State is a very good team. I think they're ranked now. They get ranked off that one, mm -hmm, number twenty two. Uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. you know they're they're sitting at three and one, and I think they uh, you know they might have something to say here before the season's over in in the group of five uh, arguments. You know what's funny is that right after that game ended, what happened? 
I, I, I text you or I Facebook oh, message yeah. you. Oh yeah. <laughs> with, with a picture of the upset win and the only thing you you respond back was just a perfect response. You said, I love Pac-12 football. <laughs> there you go. That's it. Yeah. And, and here's yeah, I mean, and, and here's what you got with that. So you got Oregon and that's it. So <laughs> yep. But, yep. But, what, but what I'm saying at the beginning of the year, when I picked Washington to win the Pac-12, but Oregon to be the best team, I'm still going to stand by that Oregon's the best team part. Well, 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 well look, well, look <laughs> at me. I, the rest part. Yeah, yeah, forget about the other part. <laughs> well, 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 listen here. You, you, you see who I had as, as winning the Pac-12 Utah. And their yeah, quarterback, uh, their quarterback, he he, you know, he gets benched, and you know, a few days later, Charlie Brewer he he quits the team. Yeah. So I mean that 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 place, I yeah, you never know what you're gonna get from the Pac-12, man. Uh, Pac-12 yeah. after dark is a real thing. It's a real it's thing. A lot, lot of drama. Yeah, a lot of drama. It's like a soap opera, man. A <laughs> lot is. of drama. It is. Um, and there's more to come this week, I think. So yeah, we're gonna get to some of those games as yeah. well. The best player that I saw week three was for my UNC Tar Heels is oh, rece- wide receiver. Guy. Same guy. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. <laughs> it's okay. We could talk. We could talk them yeah. up. You know, oh, yeah. I love the Tar Heels. Um, UNC's wide receiver, Josh Downs versus Virginia. He had eight catches for 204 yards and two touchdowns. I think he averaged, if I can do the math there, it's a little over 25 yards per catch. Yeah. I, I know the biggest thing, uh, you know, leading into this season was the Sam Howell, you know, with losing a couple NFL guys at the running back and, and the receiver. I know Daz Newsome, um, I think he plays for the Bears now, one of the receivers he lost. Are they going to be able to replace him? I think they certainly found their guy in Josh Downs. If he keeps playing like that, I think UNC could could live up to the billing that I had him preseason. Yeah, no, I agree. I, what a performance! Um, what what a an offensive, uh, you know, showcase that game Ooh. was, and, and mm-hmm. you know that that kind of uh, <laughs> would segue me into my uh, fill in the blank of uh, best quarterback in a losing performance, <laughs> and uh, I went with Brendan Armstrong, mm-hmm. of, the lefty, uh, of, lefty, uh, yeah, Virginia, thirty nine to fifty four, five hundred and fifty four yards and four touchdowns and lost. <laughs> That's why I love college football. Yeah. That right there, wow. that right there shows it like it. That's that makes yep. it the best team that I saw in week three. And I'm going to name this team as your team, the Ole Miss Rebels. This team oh, is yeah. now they're now three and oh, they won handedly 61 21 over Tulane. We actually thought that was going to be a game, and it yep. was not close from the start. I got a question for you Is Matt Corral the Heisman favorite? I, I think he has to be right now. Mm. I, I think that. Uh, you know, as, as of right now, he is, he's probably him. I, I think you'd have to say him and maybe Bryce Young or, you know, I, I mean, but, and we'll see when they, when they face off in a couple of weeks. Can't um, wait. And you, you mentioned that's a game now. you're looking forward to. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's uh that's a fun one. But I, I tell you, Ole Miss is, they, they look good. They, they, mm-hmm. they look really good. We'll see if that defense can can hold up, you know. But man, when they put their their foot on the uh, the gas pedal, they just no kept looking rolling. back. There ain't I, no I looking back. That, I was a little surprised they didn't um, kind of uh, pull you know Corral earlier, but in the in the game because you know they started they were putting it down, you know, in the third quarter. I think you know had fifty some, and there wasn't there was no looking back there. But they uh, they left them in and and let them keep throwing. So. Look, hey, when when, you know. when Lane Kiffin only follows one high school quarterback and that quarterback is is Arch Arch Manning, Archie Manning. Yeah. I, I think he wants to show that look, I'm gonna keep yeah. the quarterback in. I can put you up for the Heisman. Look what I do with Matt Corral. Just imagine what I could do with you. So oh, ain't yeah. no taking out a, a potential Heisman winner. No, no. <laughs> that's 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 just good marketing. Uh for, <laughs> great marketing. <for> Lane Kiffin. <laughs> yes, sir. So let's do the fill in the blank. My best fill in the blank for week three will be the best atmosphere of week three. The best atmosphere of week three, I mentioned it. Penn State's 110,000 raucous fans, mostly majority uh, 21 or maybe under 21, yeah. drunken college students in the <laughs> whiteout. Absolutely crazy. I told you about that place. I told you about Kinnick Stadium and I told you about, about uh, Penn State. 
those are the two most slept on places to play in all of college football and again when you got 110,000 in a night game all white out and again they're going crazy they love their team and penn state if you look up they can win the big 10 the way ohio state's playing the way they're looking wisconsin you don't know what you're going to get from them obviously we, we got iowa but between iowa and penn state those are, have the, been the best teams within the big 10 so my best fill in the blank for week three was the best atmosphere and, and, and penn state has it yeah no and, and that was that was a great atmosphere there and, and that was a a really fun game like i said my fill in the blank was was brennan armstrong but uh you know, um, my, but to segue on that, the Penn State, I actually had uh, Penn State as my team of the week just because winning that game in the way. And I think just the way that Sean Clifford um, was so efficient, you know, 28-32 throwing, two touchdowns. Uh, he just look, he's, looks a lot better this year. Um, yeah, he looks so, a lot more confident. He does. He does. And, we, you know, it's been preseason. We didn't have a lot of, you know, glowing reports on him. But I, but I think that, you know, uh, a full full spring and you know fall camp and you know new offensive coordinator and you know yep, it, it Mark, seems like it's clicking. Mm-hmm. You know I you know it. they play defense and you know they play defensive Penn State and, and that was a great defensive game really both teams mm-hmm. really brought it defensively but uh you know I, I, why not Penn State because uh, Ohio State definitely looks like they have some some issues that they need to fix uh, really quick I, I think a lot of teams show that they have some issues. Um, yeah. you know so yeah it'd be interesting moving forward yeah it, it definitely will and I think for a team like Penn State and we talked about this last week you know you you have Dotson wonderful receiver I mean he's right up there with the uh the Ohio State receivers in terms of his explosiveness and playmaking ability they have Parker Washington who's another really good receiver they have uh Mike Yurkich the offensive coordinator for Penn State he has instilled confidence for Sean Clifford and I think he's made the game simpler for him yeah and Sean Clifford is he's just he he's a he he can be a good college quarterback with the offensive coordinator like the one they have and if he can just control the game let their defense fly around you know give give the ball to the athletes keep it very simple if they can win a lot of games they're going to be a force to be reckoned with in the Big Ten there All right, next segment, we have our power rankings. This is a special shout out to the school city of Hobart. Simple as that, man. Special shout out to the people that have embraced me over the last few years. So shout out to you guys there. We are going to do our top five teams. You can add in a few honorable mentions if you would like. You can also add some teams that maybe are sliding. Clemson. Uh, So (laughs) with that being said, uh, my top five teams will go from five all the way down to one. My number five team, Texas A&M, they're the AP number seven. I have them at number five. They did what they had to do against, uh, who did they play this week? Gosh. New Mexico. New Mexico. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, quite as kept, you know, thought New Mexico could keep it within, I mean, it's a lot of points, but 30 points, you know, Texas A&M did what they had to do, a 35-0 win. Um, that was great to see. My number four team is Iowa. They're AP number five, but I have them a slot above. They are the best Big Ten team right now, currently. My number three team, the Oregon Ducks. Best team west of uh, west of Indiana, I guess you can say. Uh, the only team on the West Coast that you know what you're going to get from them. They are the AP number three, and they're the number three for me. This is where it gets tricky. I have the number two team as the Alabama Roll Tide. Yes, yes. And my number one team would then make the Georgia Bulldogs. I cannot wait, and I cannot stress, I cannot wait until they actually play each other. They should have each other on the schedule. I think that's an annual game, and I cannot wait for that matchup. And if I had to pick it right now, I'm going with the Georgia Bulldogs to win that game. So write it down. I want you to remember that, Mook. Remember I said it. Georgia will be Alabama this year. Now, wow. team teams that I have, honorable mention, top five for me in my power rankings. Oklahoma's number four in the AP. They didn't make my top five. They did get a, a really good win against a rival in Nebraska. So you got to, you know, you got to tip your hat there. Number six, Penn State just talked about them. Um, they just missed my top five. And then Cincinnati, you know, they, they had a big win over my Hoosiers. Um, they came out slow, but they did what they had to do to get that win. The teams that are sliding for me, Clemson. I don't know what is going on with Dabble and his boys. They can't score. They can't move the ball. 
DJ Ugalele, five former five-star quarterback, he doesn't look anything like a five-star quarterback. And then Ohio State, they don't look as bad as Clemson, but again, I mean, a close game in their last matchup. For some reason, these two teams that have so much talent, they have all these five stars, for some odd reason, they seemingly cannot put it together this early in the year. Now it is early, you know, a lot of things change and typically cream rises to the top. But with those two teams, Clemson and Ohio State, they're going the opposite way of where they should be going. Uh, no, I agree. Uh, absolutely. Um, my my top five, I have number five, Penn State, uh, 3-0. We, we kind of covered what they've been doing well, but uh, I have them there. Number four, I have with the with a big question mark, but defensively, they look great. We're going to find out a lot more about them this week. But I got the Aggies, you know, of uh, A&M at number four. Uh, number three, uh, the Ducks. Um, they're 3-0, and and looking at the schedule, I mean, they should run the table. But, I mean, they from what it looks right now, barring injuries or whatever, I don't see a team, other than my early prediction of Washington, which I don't feel the same about, that's going to beat mm-hmm. Oregon in the, in no. the Pac-12. No. Um, I don't. I don't know a team in the Pac-12 that even wants to play them. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two at Georgia. Um, the defense looking great. Offense starting to come around. Yes. Get yes. Little, get a little scary for mm-hmm. you know if if your name's uh, Alabama. Um, mm-hmm. You know they showed that they're they're gettable, which we haven't always been able to say or this early on. You know, but. Uh, uh, you know, it's been a couple games now. Alabama showed maybe they're not quite what they were last year, which is that's an awful hard thing to yeah. be that all time great that, team, but, right? Sure, right. but uh, but they have some uh, they have some things that they need to improve upon. The best of the rest for me, I I dropped Oklahoma out of mind to like I have number six in mind, but you know they have some things they have to figure out, and they, they better start this week uh, with West Virginia. Ohio State, I have them in my in my seventh slot. You know, if, if I was going to you know slot it that way, um, I love uh, the freshman Henderson running the football. I, I think that offensively, they're going to get a lot, put a lot of points on the board. Defensively, there's some teams in the Big Ten that are going to give them some problems, and uh, mm-hmm. you know they they're going to have to iron some things out there. Then I have Iowa, Florida moves into my probably top ten. Uh, with their performance. So I look yeah. forward to Florida Georgia game in a few weeks. But I want to see how Florida bounces back this week against Tennessee. That's an interesting mm-hmm, one itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then Cincinnati would be kind of my my other team. And they you know they got in a hole early but they came back and, and got it done against the Hoosiers. So yep, they certainly did. All right. So those are our power rankings of our top five teams. The next segment, we're going to go with the pick the winner segment of week four. I want to give a special shout out to the Legacy Indiana offseason football program. Now, we're going to go through the top 25 matchups. We mentioned Fresno State. They are currently newly cemented number 22 team in the nation. Um, They play UNLV on Friday night. That's a 10 p.m. kickoff on CBS Sports Network. We won't talk much about that game, but just letting you guys know the number 22 team plays there. Number one, Alabama plays at home against Southern Miss. Number two, Georgia plays on the road at Vanderbilt. Number three, Oregon plays Arizona in a night kickoff. Again, Pac-12 after dark. Be careful there. The game I want to hit on here is unranked West Virginia facing number four, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, they are 16 and a half point favorites. This game is on ABC at 730 as a kickoff. Oklahoma is 5-0 straight up in their last five games overall as well as they are 5-0 and straight up in their last five games when facing West Virginia. Mook, would you like to start or would you like me to begin? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. I, I No problem starting. You know, West Virginia is, you know, they, you're talking about a team coming off a, a big, you know, kind of, well, I, I guess the odds said they weren't an upset winner over Virginia Tech, but, uh, you know, the rankings said that they were. You yep, know, and, and I, we called that one. Right, right. So we got West Virginia uh, come, kind of coming off that and, uh, 
you know, there's nothing that really distinguishes West Virginia offensively this year. I mean, in the past, they had some, you know, pretty wide open offenses and some, you know, good, great receivers and, and you know, throwing ball over. They don't have that offensive explosion um, this year. They're kind of calling cards a little bit more on the defensive side. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about Oklahoma and what they need to do. Um, they need to kind of convince the uh, – a lot of people out there that they are worthy of a of, of playoff bid uh, because if it comes down to it, the way that they're playing in some of these close games, they may not get that bid. So they really need to uh, establish some things early with West Virginia. They do have some players coming back. They had a couple out last week, um, but they, you know, they are going to have, I think, two of them back. I think uh, one of their defensive backs and their center should be back. So, they need to get things right. Spencer Rattler, he needs to make some plays, um, mm-hmm. not force the ball so much. And make the I simple play, it, too. Yeah, yes, make the simple play. I, I do think that Oklahoma is going to make a statement in this game. I know it's a 16-and-a-half point spread. I look for about a three-touchdown you know, kind of win for Oklahoma in this. But, hey, you know what? Uh, they haven't really shown that yet this year, so that's me really taking going on a limb to say that. No, I, I, I agree. I, I, I do think that West Virginia keeps it close here. You mentioned they, they are a program that, you know, used to be a high flying offense, but they've transitioned to more of a defensive focused team. I do have Oklahoma winning this game, especially being at home. They pull out these type of wins. Now, you do have to be careful of the, you know, the letdown effect. You have that game last week, you know, emotions are high and now they come back home and play. You know what 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 should be a you know uh an inferior team you know a team they should by vegas standards they should beat up on but west virginia is one of those teams where again they, they can play defense and when you can slow down an offense like that and in, in, in oklahoma has a defense that's has nothing to write home about so if west virginia can you know score some points you never know where this game could could lead um but with all that said i do have oklahoma winning this game but i do feel like west virginia keeps it within that number all right, number five, Iowa. They have the Colorado State Rams coming to their place. So that's who Iowa plays. Penn State, they have, there's actually no number on this game. <laughs> They're going to play Villanova at home. Um, that should be a blowout there. The game of the week, you have number seven, Texas A&M, who's five and a half points favorites over now number 16, Arkansas. This game will be held at the AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas, 3.30 kickoff on CBS. Texas A&M is 5-0 straight up in their last five games overall. Um, they're also 5-0 straight up in their last five games against Arkansas. Arkansas, however, is 4-1 against the spread in their last five games overall, and the total has gone over in four of Arkansas's last five games. That was a lot. I feel like I spoke a lot, so I'll let you speak, Mook. Who do you have winning this game? Well, you know, first and foremost, I think that it's um, a bit of a, a disservice this year, possibly, that this game is put, being played at at t Stadium. But, you know, Jerry Jones being an old Arkansas guy, he, want, he mm-hmm. wants his match up there. So, mm-hmm. he, he, you know, mm-hmm. I think if this game's in Fayetteville, I, I, I think it's a, a lot scarier for Texas A&M. Texas A&M's got to do something offensively that that um, makes believers out of people. I think I think everyone knows their defense is is very good. Zach Calzada is going to be quarterback and looks like the rest of the way out. I believe there's some you know some question marks with him that you know that he's got to answer. Offensively, they're just not great, you know. And on the other no, side of it, no. Sam Pittman's offense is uh, is really humming right now with uh, KJ Jefferson, you know really running the show for that team. Uh, and then plus they have a pretty diverse rushing attack. I, I like a and I like their defense to hold up, maybe get, you know, a, a late turnover, something to ice the game. I think it'll be a really good one. I think if this game was in Fayetteville that, that I might go with, you know, Arkansas, but uh, I am going to take uh, the Aggies in this one. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be opposite of you. I'm going with Arkansas for a, Actually, a, a few of the reasons you mentioned, Texas A&M, their, their defense is really stout. It's a reason why they're in my top five power rankings. But their offense, they just simply, they don't 
you know, if they're playing, uh, who did they play last week again? They played uh, New Mexico. If they're playing New Mexico, they can, you know, have some explosive plays. But if they play a competitive foe like Arkansas, I don't think they have that explosiveness. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that that happens in this game in terms of the making the big play. And this will be a low scoring game for, 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 you know, relative to what Arkansas is used to. But I think the way Arkansas can, can move the ball, especially running the ball, mm-hmm. I don't think they have to have a high scoring game to win this matchup. So that works right into their hands. So with that being said, and again, they're, they're four and one against the spread in their last five games overall. They're playing really, really well. I think they have a lot of confidence there. This is not a home game. It is a shame that it's actually not a home game for them. But, you know, for Texas, Arkansas, those those fans are going to travel. Um, the atmosphere is going to be crazy there. Who doesn't want to, you know, come to Jerry's world? And, oh, yeah. you know, you never know. It's Jerry's world. He is he is a, a famous alum of, of Arkansas. Maybe you get a little bit of home cooking there. So uh, give me the Arkansas Razorbacks there. I will be glued and tuned in to this matchup. 3.30 kickoff on CBS. All right, running down some more of the top 25 matchups. Number nine, Clemson visits NC State. That'll be an ESPN game at 3.30. Akron faces in-state rival. (laughs) Uh, Number 10, Ohio State. Ohio State is uh, 50-point favorites there. Uh, And that was tongue-in-cheek when I said. uh, The the rivalry (laughs) rivalry continues. Yeah, the rivalry continues. The the check will clear, Akron. Don't you worry. The check will be there on Monday. <laughs> Another matchup that I mentioned early in the season, I'm really looking forward to, and I'm glad that it's happening this week. You mentioned it. Tennessee faces number 11, Florida. Florida's 20 point favorites, 7 p.m. kickoff on ESPN. Um, we're going to highlight this game. Florida is 5 0 straight up in their last five games against Tennessee. Florida is also 15 1 straight up in their last 16 games overall when facing Tennessee. Wow, I did not know that. And the total has gone under in eight of Tennessee's last 11 games on the road and also 13 of the last 18 games overall. So I want you to pick the winner in this matchup. Yeah, so, you know, they say Tennessee has gone to under um, in the last five matchups or whatever. Tennessee hasn't had Josh Heifel running their offense mm, in true. those matchups. So um, mm-hmm. I think Tennessee is going to put some points up in this game. A 20-point dog in this one seems... A little bit like a lot to me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how Florida bounces back. You know, uh, are they going to be inspired by their performance? Are they going to be a little dejected, dejected by it? I mean, it's a pretty big rivalry. It's their 51st meeting between the two, which actually is less than I thought, thinking that, you know. Yeah. I thought, uh, yeah. The That's crazy. They didn't always play the way it was lined up before. So, um, but, you know, it is the third Saturday in. Uh, September, I believe they call, or, or yeah, they call that rivalry. But uh, I, I think that Florida is going to kind of roll with uh, some momentum in this one. I think that you're going to see some mistakes by Tennessee, and I and I'm going to say that I'm going to take the Gators to win this one. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't think mm-hmm. they'll cover the spread, but I, mm-hmm. I think that they're going to win. You know. Yeah, you're you're speaking my language. If this game was in Tennessee, I would be really worried about Florida losing this game. Because again, yeah. you, this is this is a quote unquote rival. But when you play Alabama the week before, you're so close to beating the number one team. It's very hard to come back the next week and, and, and bring the same amount of emotion there. But being at home for Florida and 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 to me, the letdown factor has a lot to do with your coaching. And Dan Mullins is one of the best coaches in the SEC. He will have them prepared and ready. He will have them focus on the fact that, hey, we still have everything that we we work for this this season. Everything we have as a goal is still out in front of us. They can still get it done. So I do have Florida win in this matchup. But with that being said, I agree with you. It will be a, a higher scoring affair than what many would think. And I do think Tennessee scores enough points to keep it with under that that 20 point number. But again, Florida, to me, they win this matchup. And, and, and Dan Mullen, again, he has everything in front of them that, that they want that they that they that they want to accomplish this season and it's just another game that that clearly we are both really looking forward to uh, a lot of really good matchups this week 
Um, next really good matchup here will be number 12, Notre Dame against number 18, Wisconsin. Wisconsin is a six and a half point favorite here. And this game will be hosted at Soldier Field in, in Chicago. So Indiana team of, of, of Notre Dame and, and, and a Wisconsin team uh, of the Badgers, they will meet in Chicago at 12 o'clock on Fox. Notre Dame is 19 and two straight up overall in their last 21 games. However, Notre Dame is two and four against the spread in their last six games. Um, the total has gone under in six of Wisconsin's last seven games overall. Mook, pick the winner here. Okay, that, I've gone back and forth on this one. This one's a tough one for me. Uh, just kind of trying to feel out what this game is going to look like. I think, first of all, Wisconsin's defense, uh, Jim Leonard's defense is going to... They've been exceptional so far this year. And uh, I think that this is going to be a big test for them to see how good they actually are. Um, I think that Penn State early on, who they played, they played very well against them. I don't think Penn State was as good offensively, you know, three weeks ago as they are now. So, you know, it's kind of hard to tell where they are. Graham Mertz, I think he really needs to step up if they're going to win this football game. Yeah, he, he does, has, man. He's been he, disappointing. He ha- Yeah, he, he has been. You know, he started off last year really hot and getting the uh, – getting all the accolades but when it comes down to it he hasn't been great and Mm -mm. i think that once upon a time they thought you know well what do we need a uh a jack cone for when we have grant mertz but it's jack cone who now is at notre dame is Mm -hmm. the better the Mm -hmm. two quarterbacks playing Mm -hmm. right now i I look for him to make some plays in this game i think that it's going to be one of those games there's probably going to be a lower scoring affair I think maybe you'll see Kyron Williams bust one, you know, because he always seems to bust one every, every game. And uh, I, I look for like a, about a field goal victory for the Irish. So Notre Dame has played. They played Florida State, who's 0-3 right now. They beat Toledo. They beat Purdue. Okay. And Wisconsin has played. They played Penn State week one. Then they played Eastern Michigan, and now they're playing. And they had a bye week, and now they're playing Notre right. Dame. Right. To me, Notre Dame has slightly or relatively has played the tougher schedule. I don't know how Notre Dame, they're only six and a half point. Well, I don't know how they're underdogs in general. Um, right. I understand this is a road game for them, but they've played the the, t- the tougher schedules so far. They have the more they have more talent. And I, I to me, I love when a team has. Now, you typically don't get this in college football. Maybe this is kind of a sign of the, of the times. You get this for the NFL a little bit, where the team has a player, especially a quarterback, that is of a former team, and I feel like that team plays much harder that week for that for that quarterback when he's playing against his former team. So you have that situation here with, with uh, Jack Cohn and Notre Dame. Notre Dame has more talent. Wisconsin, you talked about it. Merch, you never know what you're going to get out of that quarterback. And I just feel like Notre Dame is going to play much harder knowing that, hey, this is the opportunity for our now quarterback, Jack Cohn, for him to beat his former team. And they're going to play even harder, play even tougher. And Notre Dame, you know, they have their ups and downs this year, but they have the defense to slow down a Wisconsin offense that is nothing to write home about. And, and they have an explosive run game that can that can take over at any time. To me, this is the, if you want to call it that, for me, this is my upset pick of the week. And I I have, I don't even want to put a number on this. I have Notre Dame winning by 10 points. 10 points, I would say, double digit points in this matchup. Like, I just don't see how Wisconsin, especially not being a true home game, how they keep it under that number. And they definitely won't win this matchup. So give me Notre Dame here. Some other ranked matchups. Number 14, Iowa State plays Baylor. They are seven point favorites there. South Florida visits number 15, BYU. UMass, if you even call that a a college team, a high school team to me, they face uh, number 17, Coastal Carolina. Coastal Carolina, they are 36 point favorites on the Teal Turf. That's a 330 kickoff on ABC. 
I'm sorry, that's a 1 p.m. kickoff on ESPN. The 3.30 kickoff on ABC is a game we want to highlight quickly. Rutgers facing number 19, Michigan. Number 19, Michigan, they are 20 and a half point favorites over Rutgers. Michigan is 5-0 straight up in their last five games against Rutgers. Rutgers, however, is 5-0 against the spread in their last five games on the road. The total has gone over in the last five matchups between these two teams. Mook, pick the winner in this game. Uh, you know, that, let's put it this way. I, I know Rutgers is undefeated. Um, they, they haven't really played a great schedule. But Greg Schiano is is getting some things done with them, um, especially mm-hmm. defensively. They're going to see something different that that not a lot of teams in the country have seen, and that's this three headed monster kind of that Michigan is at the running backs. The run game, yes. Yeah, I mean, coming into the season, Hassan ha- ha- uh, Haskins had a lot of uh, talk of having a good year, but it's been him along with the the. Blake Corum has had the bigger year, and now all of a sudden Donovan Edwards is yes, you know, from my alma this. mater, West Bloomfield yeah. High School. Yes, Donovan Edwards. Yeah, shout out to you. Yeah, so I mean, you know, and, and this offensive line is mauling people. So uh, you know, they're getting exactly what they need out of. Uh, uh, um, oh shoot, I just. His name is escaped me. Uh, McNamara. Uh, McNamara, right? Yeah, yep. Cade McNamara. Cade McNamara. They're getting what he need out of him. You know, he's he's getting some, uh, you know, the ball out there at a, at a rate that's you know very efficient. But it, it it's kind of reminiscent of, uh, you know, some of those um, Stanford teams that that Harbaugh had, where they were heavy, heavy run. You know, and you know, and and uh, this kind of feels that way. I don't think Rutgers is stopping this, but. This is going to be on the other side, Michigan's first non, you know, Mac school. And uh, I, what are they, what's their other win? I can't remember offhand. Yep. Yeah. They, they, they beat uh, they beat Washington and they beat. Oh, yeah. Um, well, the, the, the three Mac schools. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Again, you said last three episode, I, you never want to you never want to hear the name Washington again. <laughs> no, I they, they, never they, they again. <laughs> yeah, so, yep. they, so they got they've beaten two max in a pack so far. So they're yeah. they're uh, you know they're gonna have a little bit more tests in this one. I like this one to be uh, maybe a pretty decent game, one and a half. But I think Michigan wears them down and, and, and uh, ends up winning pretty decisively. Yeah, when you got a run game like that, and again, shout out to Donovan Edwards, uh, a West Bloomfield alumni like myself. Uh, we got a couple other guys that are. That are, that are coming up. Um, we got a couple NFL guys too. So and shout out to uh, West Bloom for high school, my Lakers. Uh, so with that, yeah, I agree with you. I, I think Rutgers at least initially keeps it close. Um, this is, if you know anything about Michigan and, and especially Jim Harbaugh and his recruiting, he does a lot of recruiting on the East Coast. That's And that's where he actually got Blake Corum. Um, he's a DMV kid. So he does a lot of recruiting on the east coast new jersey you know um rashad gary is, is from new jersey um obviously Rutgers, you know in new jersey school this is always to me a way for jim harbaugh and the michigan staff in that program to show the east coast what they have this year we're not talking about michigan a lot and i think that's actually worked into their favor and when you have a run game as you mentioned as potent as michigan has you got a three-headed monster you're able to pound the ball Rutgers keeps it close, like you mentioned. But once that second half rolls around, I don't. I, it, what they are twenty and a half point favorites. I see them, you know, maybe being up seven to ten at halftime, and then and you look up fourth quarter, they're up four scores because they their their run game is is that powerful, and it's just that efficient. And then they can play action off of that. Um, I know they lost Ronnie Bell at receiver, but they got a couple other guys that. That, that can roll too, man. So I really like Michigan in this matchup. I really like that number. So I'm with you on that. Give me Michigan. All right, next matchup, your boys. The Nebraska Cornhuskers face number 20, Michigan State. Michigan State are, are five-point favorites. This is a 7 p.m. kickoff in East Lansing. Um, this game will be on FS1. A couple trends here. Nebraska is 8-1 and one against the spread in their last nine games against Michigan State. The total has gone under in seven of Nebraska's last eight games on the road. However, the total has gone over in five of Michigan State's last six games overall. So, Mook, pick the winner. <laughs> this is going to be a, uh, a theme that you're going to hear 
probably most of the way of the season, but this is probably Scott Frost's most important game. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this game looks a lot differently. This was a game a lot of people looked at to see, you know, this is when we're going to really find out about Nebraska. And that was before they lost to Illinois, to, you know, to start the season. Where well, everybody kind of thought the Oklahoma game was going to be what it was. I think people were pleasantly surprised how well they competed in it. That said, Nebraska has looked better week in, week out. They still have some of the same problems that are plaguing them. Their offensive line is very young, but experienced, if that makes sense, because of all the, uh, they're like, you know, uh, third-year sophomores and, you know, second-year freshmen and, you know, with the COVID year, how that works out. Um, they haven't been, they haven't gelled. They lost two guys in the, the NFL, and it's hard to replace that. So, you know, their offensive line needs to get better, which means their run game needs to get better. It did improve as the game went on against Oklahoma. Started out not getting anything on the ground. Started breaking into, you know, three yards, five yards, seven yards is what you really want your line to take over. Uh, Mel Tucker's group, you know, I don't think anybody had any clue what Michigan State was going to look like this year. Mm-mm. But th- that running game is uh, with Kenneth Walker the third. He is he 500 yards rushing and five touchdowns so far. So he's getting it done on the ground. You talk about Peyton Thorne, the quarterback. He, all he's done is, is really just run the uh, play action part of the offense off of that run and, and been very accurate and been very good with it. He can do a little bit with his feet. Nebraska's going to have to, uh, you know, continue to play good defense. I don't know if they can stop, uh, you know, Kenneth Walker. They can't give up 200 yards and, and think they're going to win. If they can keep them, you know, on the buck 25 or whatever, I think it's very conceivable that they win this football game. I think at the end of the day, Adrian Martinez can can carry on the way he has been improving. Nebraska will be very much in this game, but with the special teams issues that they have, I, I got to take Sparty by like a field goal, you know, until proven otherwise, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's where that's where I'm at with it. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I want to ride with you there. I, 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 I do have Michigan State winning this game. I'm actually surprised the number is this low, but that tells me that there are some people, a little desert by the name of Las Vegas, that is giving Nebraska a little more respect than what maybe I am. Um, so w- with that being said, again, in Nebraska's 8-1 and one against the spread in their last nine games against Michigan State overall, if, 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 if Nebraska can somehow, some way, and no team has done it yet, if they can some da- somehow slow down the running game of Michigan State, clearly they have a chance in this matchup. Um, you need your quarterback, Martinez, to you know be efficient, be smart with the ball, not turn it over. Because to me, you're not going to get a lot of offense with Nebraska. You're just not. I, I think I think any Nebraska fan should understand that this is just not going to be the Scott Frost UCF right now. And it hasn't been really in terms of scoring the ball. So they need to be able to be efficient get first down slow really slow the game down now that may play into the hands of michigan state because they are kind of that defense first run game first type of team but if if nebraska wants a shot it, this has to be a low scoring game they got to slow down the run you talk about kenneth walker the third i think i read a stat he is he has the most amount of forced missed tackles at this point in the season of any running back so it's going to be very tough to to corral him to try to slow him down but if, there any, if there's any chance for Nebraska to, to do it, it has to come in the defense. It has to come with the, with the, the, with the rush defense. And it has to come with their quarterback being smart with the ball and not giving the football back to Michigan State for extra possessions. And then your kicking game in, in a close matchup is, is going to matter. Special teams matter, and it matters even more when a game is close, which I think it will be. <sighs> Something is... <laughs> Something is telling me to take Nebraska. Like, would it shock you? Would it shock you if Nebraska won this matchup after after Michigan State had what was probably, I mean, that was the, it's definitely their game of the year against Miami. I know Miami is is nothing great. It's not that Miami of old, but you go to Miami, you go down there and, and get a great upset win, and now you come back home. To me, this has it has a writing all over it to to be an, a weird upset in the Big Ten. So give me Nebraska. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what, here's the one thing I will say, and with Nebraska against Oklahoma for the first time got to run both their tight ends out, which was 
the big talk of the offseason. They have a, a six nine and a six foot seven tight end that were going to be, you know, these big targets for for uh, Adrian Martinez, and it was effective and uh, it helped them with the point of attack a little bit in the running game. And they are developing a couple nice wide receivers to go along with Adrian Mar- Martinez's legs. They just don't have the running backs right now. That that's worrisome, and and the offensive line push. So we'll see if they improve. I definitely think that it's possible, but I mean, until they stop making the mistakes and the special teams errors, that you know, uh, it's hard for me to say that you know they're going to get this game. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the tight ends because to me, if you don't have a run game, the next best thing for a quarterback and offensive coordinator is having some, you know, some slot receivers or mainly some tight ends that are able to. You know, move the chains for you. And if you got two of them that are, you know, six, seven plus, you know, they can help you in the run game, you know, potentially, but definitely help you in the short passing game and over the middle. Yeah, I, I like Nebraska to win this matchup. Next game, we have number 21, North Carolina, who is 12 point favorites against Georgia Tech. This game will be hosted at the Mercedes Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia. 730 kickoff on ACC Network. Only stat I have on this game here is that the total has gone over in five of the last six games between these two teams. Makes sense. Mook, who do you have winning this matchup? I'll make this quick. Uh, Me too. I like, I'll make North Carolina big. Yes, I, I don't North- think Tech is a good football team. I mm-hmm. just think it shows the problems that Clemson have has. So yes. I like I like the Tar Heels to win big. I'm with you on that. I got the Tar Heels winning big. I think they found their answer as a as a uh, true number one, uh, a replacement weapon for Sam Howell. All right, another matchup um, just to run over. Georgia State plays number 23 Auburn. Number 23, Auburn, is coming off of that that tough Penn State loss. They are 27-point favorites at home. And then we have a game we're going to talk about. Now, number 24, UCLA. They are actually four-and-a-half-point favorites over Stanford. At Stanford, this is a 6 o'clock game, which will be held on the Pac-12 Network. Stanford is 12-1 and straight up in the last 13 games versus UCLA. That is an amazing stat. Total has gone under in five of the last six games between these two teams. So, Mook, pick the winner here. You know, Palo Alto, California is not an easy place to play for anybody. Stanford seems to have figured something out, you know, as opposed to where they were in week one. This is big for Chip Kelly's gang. Uh, are they Are they good? Uh, are, they, are they what, you know, they, they showed early on? Um, these are the types of games where you really see what kind of team you have when you have to bounce back after some adversity. So I think that what I saw at the beginning of the year in them is more relative to who they are than what Stanford is playing like right now. Yeah. I'm going to take in a, in a kind of an ugly game, the Bruins, but mm. You know, this is going to be, you know, kind of uh, the the game that Chip Kelly needs to put that flag in the ground and say, you know, these are these are my guys. We're this is what we're doing. We we're no more of being an average football team. We're stepping up right now. So I'm going to bet on him to do that in this game. Yeah. Coach Justin Fry, you hear that? It's a challenge by Mook. <laughs> uh, Coach Fry, yeah. come on now, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 So so Stanford. They lost week one to Kansas State, who is now number 25 Kansas State. Um, So we're actually ranked one ahead of them in the polls. Then they came back week two, smacked up on USC. Um, That got Clay Helton out of here. Uh, And then they beat up on Vanderbilt, at Vanderbilt, um, in week three. So smart kid bowl. Yes, yes, yes. The smart bowl right there. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So now they come back home. The number makes sense to me to be a you know a UCLA to be a, a small favor here. What what was it? Stanford is twelve and one straight up in their last thirteen games against UCLA. Yes. I mean, did, did did you could you have guessed that stat before I read it? No, I would not. No, no. not at all. No, Stanford to me is a team that you, you mentioned it. I mean, they're calling card when they're good. They play defense. They can run the ball, and they're opportunistic on defense. And yeah, what type of team is UCLA? We really don't know. You don't know. And again, Pac-12, we, we joke about it, but it's, it's a real thing. 
you don't necessarily know what you're going to get from these Pac-12 teams week to week. And you could say that about a lot of college football teams in general. But for some odd reason on the West Coast, you never you truly do not know what you're going to get. So I don't, I don't really know how to really pick this game. Um, if I had to go with the actual number, I would take Stanford because of the way that their last 13 games, they, they beat UCLA 12 of those times. And it's a small number. So, you know, some people, again, in that little desert um, that is Las Vegas, they feel like it's going to be a tight game. If I had to actually pick the winner, I think that UCLA has they have the reason to bounce back here. <clears throat> and I think Stanford has a reason to maybe have a a, uh, a letdown. So to me, Stanford has a letdown. UCLA has a know they have a lot to play for. They're a little embarrassed from last week. They step it up this week. So in a tight game, in a game that actually is going to I think they're going to be a lot of points scored here. Give me UCLA. And I'm really looking forward to watching that game. This is a six o'clock game. Uh, I think it's an Eastern kickoff, so five o'clock for us. Uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that game. That's going to be a game that I, I definitely want to watch. And the last game, we won't speak about this long, but I was actually intrigued here. Number 25, Kansas State. They are actually six-point underdogs. Yes, six-point underdogs at Oklahoma State. What are your thoughts there? Well, I, I think that... Uh... K State's kind of a, a, they're always a kind of hard team to to gauge because they they tend to win a game they shouldn't, mm -hmm. or maybe mm -hmm. a couple of them, and then lose some that they should. Yep, um, should win. Took the words uh, out of my mouth. Yep. Yeah, Oklahoma State. You know, Mike Gundy's teams are always going to have, you know, uh, big point potential. They're going to have big time receivers. They're going to have strong, hard running running backs. And they're going to be more explosive than than uh, a Kansas State typically. Of course, uh, Kansas State, you know, with their running back, uh, Deuce. Deuce Vaughn, yes, little Deuce guy. Vaughn. I love him. He's yeah, like five foot yeah. five. What he can go. Yeah. Yeah. Little, little, you know, little jitterbug goes out. You yeah. know, hey, man, you, you, that's. The guys like he that. He runs hard too. Yeah, yeah. He's a, he, he, hey, he's he's he, he's he's like the former K State Wildcat, Darren Sproles. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, I never very thought about that. Time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? I, honestly, you know, I'm gonna go with. Uh, I, I am gonna go with Okie State in this one. I, I Me think too. The, I think the Pokes are gonna to take it to uh, K State, and uh, I, I think uh, I don't know. I think there's a lot of things that are building up in the, in the big 12 this year to, you know, to, to see what's going to happen. You know, I, I think that with some of the teams like, you know, Baylor's starting to turn around maybe a little bit, look like they might play a little ball. You know, there's some people. West what, Virginia's what is not bad. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of them. They're kind of on that cusp of, of like, uh, are they top 25 type teams or not? And, and I think that this is going to be another one to kind of muddle that up a little bit. But I'm going to go Oklahoma State. Yeah, I'm going to join you here. We talked about this last week in the we, I actually just hit on this team. West Virginia was unranked and they were favorites over the ranked Virginia Tech last week. Right. And, you know, they won that game. To me, they're telling you right here. Number 25, Kansas State. They are six point underdogs on the road. At Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State is 3-0 and right now. And you mentioned, you know, their offense. Typically with Gundy, you know, they can score a lot of points. But if you have actually look at their games, they – now they play Missouri State week one, but then they play Tulsa, then they play Boise State. Missouri State scored 16 points. Tulsa scored 23 points. And Boise State only scored 20 points. So they've actually been doing a really good job of scoring on offense, but also limiting the other teams defensively. And to me, Kansas State, they lost their quarterback, I think, two weeks ago um, against uh, Southern Illinois. Um, so they have a backup quarterback in. Vaughn, he is a really great player for them, but to me, he's not enough. They, they don't have a not enough explosiveness. And, and if you get a, a traditional Mike Gundy offense in this matchup, you know, this could be recipe for a blowout. Again, the unranked team is a favorite at home against a ranked team. I'm going with, with, with what the people in the desert feel. So give me uh, the pokes, as you mentioned, to win this matchup. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's good. And, and I just want to mention, too, that Mike Gundy, it, if you ever like go to Myrtle Beach, every travel softball dad looks exactly like Mike Gundy. 
But that's neither here nor there. But that's just a little tidbit about the game. Hey, it, another little tidbit I, I saw today. It's 14 years ago today, and it's gonna make me feel old. That Mike Gundy had his infamous speech of "I'm a man. I'm 40." <laughs> <laughs> if you want to talk about a kid, talk, if you want to, you know, write about in the paper, write about me. I'm a man. I'm 40. And I was in college when that happened. We actually played Oklahoma State in the Insight Bowl that year. Um, oh. So that makes me feel a little bit older. 14 years ago, he had that well, rant. So that, shout out to you, you know, Mike Gunn. I'm, I'm 46. So I couldn't wait until I hit 40 just so I could say that. <laughs> just say so I'm that, a man. That's how I felt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I will, I will say, Mook. You are not only a man, you're the man. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you, um, you know, doing what you do every week. Phenomenal show again this week. Um, do you have anything you would like to say? Any special shout outs? Any love you want to send? No, I just you know, just shout out to shout out to my uh, little Pee Wee Bricks, man. Love them, love them. Yeah, I'm, I see the pictures you're posting, man. They look good, man. Yeah, Kids look like they're playing yeah. hard. Yeah, look like, it looks like they're enjoying off. it. Most importantly. Yeah, no, we, we, we got a good group of kids, you know, they're, they're a good group, good, good group of parents with them and, you know, pretty much all bought into what we're doing and, and you know, kind of that, uh, our bricky way, you know, through things, but, uh, yep. Yep. nope, just, uh, just hi to my, uh, family and friends and, you know, Hey man, be good to be good to everybody, you know, yes. tough times out there. Just it, rally, rally for each other, you know, rally, like, like I tell my kids fight for each other not with each other you know fight for each other not with each other with each other i yep. like that there you go and, and if you can put a smile on someone's face say hello to someone ask how their day is going uh just be a polite human being you know Absolutely. the old saying you know treat someone as if you would want them to treat you all right yep. all right so that'll wrap it up so from mook from us to you this is me coach t keep showing love keep showing support and we'll keep doing that thing. Peace.